please visit sleephappia.org to get more videos like this one, as well as audio and blog content. Join us at sleepapnea.org to be included in the conversation and updated whenever new programs are available. Thanks for joining us and enjoy. Welcome to another speaker series with the American Sleep Apnea Association. I'm so excited tonight. I actually have a former colleague of mine's, uh, Maureen Conley, and uh, we are going to discuss her diagnosis of restless leg syndrome and Maureen is also a um, CPAP user. So welcome Maureen and thank you for joining us. Thank you, Kevin. It's my pleasure to be here. So Maureen, I will let the audience know that we um, affectionately call you Mo. So that's what I will uh, refer to you during this interview. But again, yeah, thank you so much for joining us. I just wanted to give a little bit of background on Mo. Uh, she recently retired from um, being my colleague for the last six years with me working there in the Living Donor Program. But Maureen has led quite an esteemed career with St. Michael's Hospital and was a nurse there for over 46 years. Uh, Maureen worked in various units, uh, including the ER, ICU, and um, ended her, um, like I said, quite esteemed career um, running the Living Donor Program. So again, Mo, we're so happy that you joined us. Thank you, Kevin. So I just wanted to start, Mo. Um, can you tell me how you, how did your sleep apnea journey start? And in particular to restless legs, what came first or did they both come together? I would say the restless legs predated uh, the, the sleep apnea by many years. Uh, even as a teenager, uh, I had uh, inklings of it, but no awareness of what that really was. And uh, the sleep apnea was diagnosed after an eMERGE visit where I developed palpitations at night uh, that were worrisome to me uh, and that I felt like I was having such a significant arrhythmia that I better get it medically attended to. And it went away on its own with uh, some blood pressure medication adjustment, but also the eMERGE doctor was the one who pinpointed uh, the fact that I could very well have sleep apnea. So from there I went, I was referred to a respirologist and uh, had a sleep study done uh, in which I felt like I didn't sleep at all, but they told me I did. And uh, then went back to see the respirologist who gave me the diagnosis of moderate sleep apnea and also significant restless leg syndrome uh, that they picked up with the sleep study. So I was put on a CPAP machine and then also medication for my restless legs that's helped significantly. So Mo, a couple of points there. It's very interesting and quite impressive that the ER doctor actually decided to send you for a sleep study. Um, that was a really good idea on their behalf. But can you just let us know how long ago was this? Uh, it was likely about six years ago. And yeah. uh, it, uh, you know, I had the CPAP machine um, right away and uh, found that it was a real game changer for me. I didn't have any difficulty adjusting to it. I've, I've heard a lot of our patients talk about that, uh, but I was, I guess, really fortunate that I just felt like it was just a bit of gentle white noise in the background. Uh, my husband didn't find it disturbing and the overall benefits of it, of being able to have a better quality sleep and feel more rested during the day uh, was a real game changer for me. Great. Great. So, okay, prior to the sleep study and um, being, you know, going to the emergency room with palpitations and your blood pressure was elevated, which is interesting because we've done speaker series on these issues before um, relating to you know, coexisting conditions um, due to sleep apnea. What were you feeling? You know, were you aware that you had restless leg syndrome? Oh, absolutely, right from my uh, teen years, um, but didn't really have a name for it, didn't really make that connection, um, even though my father suffered significantly from it. 
uh, and my son has inherited the condition from me. Um, but it was just this overwhelming urge to have to move my legs, um, especially at night. Um, and if, uh, if I were at a theater or a movie show, uh, I'd always sit on the aisle seat because I knew I was gonna have to get up and stretch, go to the washroom, come back and uh, try and have some relief from just getting up and moving. And a lot of people have described it in different ways, for, but for me, it felt like snakes crawling through my legs and that there was no way to get comfortable uh, other than just getting up and moving and stretching. Wow. So even as a teenager, I had it. You know, and it's interesting that we worked together so closely in an office for six years, and I never knew that you you suffered from this other than, you know, obviously we, you told me. But so tell me about the medication that you're taking and, and how is that working for you? Uh, it's a medication that is typically used for Parkinson's. Uh, it's a dopamine, dopamine um, agonist. And it uh, is given in smaller doses for restless legs compared to somebody with Parkinson's. So that's the class of medication I'm on. Uh, the doctor did try to switch me to uh, another medication called Lyrica or Gabapentin, but I didn't tolerate it as well. Uh, I felt I was having more side effects that were not uh, insignificant and uh, I felt I was better on the Pramipexel. And it's amazing if I'm with another physician for other consults, the number of ones that aren't familiar with uh, the use of that medication other than for Parkinson's. They don't know it's for restless legs as well. Oh, I see. So they're wondering why you're on that medication. So, you know, with the side effects, tell me, like, what were you experiencing? Um, I just I felt really fatigued on it um, and just really, really tired and having some muscle aches and other weird sensations that I didn't feel comfortable on it. Sure. So, Mo, it's interesting because when I had my sleep study, I also felt that I didn't sleep, but I still came away with a diagnosis of mild sleep apnea. And there have been times before when I did have the, you know, inclination that maybe I had sleep apnea or didn't know what was going on. I used to have like what they refer to as non-purposeful limb movement where, you know, I would try and kick the bottom of the bed. And or I could, I was conscious of the fact that I was kicking the bed. Is that something that happened to you as well, um, or is that a separate issue? I think that with my symptoms, it was really, literally, almost like cycling to heaven. I was constantly moving my legs, turning from side to side, just to try and get some relief, and disrupting my husband's sleep, which uh, often, more often than not. It resulted in me being in the spare bedroom uh, because yeah. I'm not sleeping myself, but disrupting his sleep. So different uh, things that uh, Kevin that I felt helpful uh, was just even you know a glass of warm milk before going to bed, uh, limiting caffeine. I uh, don't have any coffee after early morning. Um, really limiting any wine during the evening before going to bed, uh, having my last meal of the day at least three hours before I go to sleep. And uh, sometimes even other medications, if my legs are really bad, would be just even a little bit of codeine, a small dose of codeine, like a uh, narcotic medication to supplement the restless leg medication. So over time, I've kind of learned how to recognize uh, when my legs are gonna be really bad. And some days are better than others. And oftentimes uh, if I'm feeling it earlier in the evening, I'll take the medication uh, earlier in the evening so that it's had its effect well before I'm going to bed. Yeah, yeah. Well, let me ask you this, Mo. You know, when you started um, CPAP therapy, 
did you feel that that actually helped? Was it like, you know what we mean by adjunct therapy? So you're on CPAP and then you're also on medication for another problem, but they feel there is a correlation between obstructive sleep apnea and restless leg syndrome. So did you feel again, like when that happened, that it improved? Um. I think because I've got primary restless legs, I don't have any other underlying medical cause for it. Uh, it was very difficult for me to really say whether the sleep, uh, the CPAP made a significant difference for it or if it was the medication. Um, I really wouldn't be able to tell you that, but the two of them were, I was getting treated for both at the same time. Uh, and if I didn't have sleep apnea, and just had the restless legs, then I would say yeah, just the medication alone was uh, probably the game changer for me. Yeah, and I feel it's interesting as well. Obviously, when we go through a sleep study, we are being monitored, um, you know, in various respiratory state, oxygen saturations, obviously how many times you stop breathing at night. But also there is a camera on you and, and they're, you know, text watching you to see if you're jumping all over the bed or not. So, you know, we would encourage people that they feel, if they feel, sorry, that they are maybe suffering from restless leg syndrome is to contact your sleep center and get a study. Totally agree, Kevin. And uh, interestingly enough, after I had this awareness myself of having sleep apnea, uh, the number of people I would see in public spaces or in public transit who clearly have sleep apnea that they probably haven't been diagnosed. It's, I think it's common that people realize. Yeah, definitely. And you know, interestingly enough as well, Mo, we worked together for so long. And again, like I said, you know, I would never have known that you would have restless leg syndrome because for me, I thought it was somebody that was just jittery all the time and, and, and needed to constantly move their legs like I used to do when I was a bit younger. But, you know, that sensation is typical of people's experience, like snakes crawling, like you said, or ants, or just that feeling of, you know, your legs just want to move all the time. Is that that's pretty much what you were experiencing? Yeah. Yes, absolutely. And yeah. even, you know, I don't, I guess you didn't realize how many times I had to stand up from my desk and, and stretch even during the day, just uh, having the, the medication and the CPAP, it's not a cure-all. It, uh, it's a chronic condition that I live with and that I've had to adapt to um, and make adjustments in my lifestyle to try and improve the symptoms. Uh, interestingly enough, I I've, I've discovered a website, the, the Restless Leg uh, Foundation, uh, www.rls.org, uh, with helpful information there for patients. And if people haven't had a diagnosis of restless legs, uh, I would imagine that people who have these symptoms that we're describing would think that, oh, I must have that and I should really check it out. And I would say it's well worth it. Yeah. No, that's great advice. Thanks, Mo. And again, I think it's encouraging people to think that, you know, if that's the case, um, maybe it's a question of, well, getting a, a sleep study also to correlate whether there's an underlying obstructive sleep apnea cause, or is this something totally separate? But, you know, one of the other points I was going to make with you or, or ask you is like, and you did cover some of this, was you know, therapy that you've used apart from the medications. So again, it's like, you know, your coffee intake, your wine, you know, getting to bed, taking your medication early. Anything else that you can think of? Um, lavender. Sometimes people feel that lavender is really soothing. Uh, massage. I go for regular massages. A stretching, doing some easy stretches before you get into bed. Uh, a warm bath, any of those things can help. Yeah. And, you know, I did want to ask, I, I wanted to know as well, even though this was diagnosed during your sleep study, who follows you now for restless legs? Because, you know, we have a respirologist maybe following our 
numbers during CPAP therapy. Who who do you actually go for your medication to for your restless leg syndrome? Uh, I see the respirologist once a year, and uh, he just checks on to see how I'm doing with the medication. But otherwise, my family doctor has been able to prescribe it for me. And um, I've only had a sleep study done a couple of times that my last numbers uh, with the machine were so good that I didn't need to go back for a repeat sleep study. It was doing quite well on the uh, uh, how the machine was adjusted for me. Yeah. I know you were quite proud one time after your appointment and you came into the office and said your AHI was like 0.8 or something, which was great to get out. Yeah. Yeah. Um, interestingly enough, Mo and I shared an office with another um, co-worker and all three of us were CPAP users. Um, Mo and I being probably the more adherent and the other one, maybe not so much, but we were working on her. <laughs> So that was interesting. So Mo, anything else you would give advice to for someone um, that was out there thinking, is this what I have? Um, I have heard as well that maybe it can affect other limbs and not just your legs. People may experience some sensation in their arms, for example. Or like if somebody out there was thinking, wow, is that me? Do I have that? What, what would you tell them to do? I would think talk to your family doctor first. Uh, in particular, if you have an underlying medical condition that can make uh, restless legs more prominent or problematic for you, um, and seeing if there's any other vitamin supplements that uh, would be helpful um, treating the underlying medical condition, and especially if you've already got a diagnosis of diabetes or peripheral, neuro peripheral neuropathy. Um, stopping smoking if you're a smoker. Uh, we see firsthand the damage that smoking does with our uh, patient population. Um, and then also dealing with just the, the stress of life. This is uh, during the current time, we're dealing with a lot of sleepless nights uh, just because of the pandemic and uh, being able to talk to people uh, and uh, get help for and support for other conditions or issues that you're dealing with uh, that disrupt your sleep. So Mo, I wanted to look back when you said your dad was diagnosed with restless leg syndrome. Now you have it and you were concerned or you did say that your son also had it. I'm not sure that I saw anything that I read that it was hereditary or familial. Do, what, what are your thoughts on that? I don't know that there's a lot of data on it. Uh, the uh, the research, or the Russell's Leg uh, Foundation, I believe, is doing more research on it. But they there is a suggestion that there is a correlation that it can be a gene that's passed along between family members. Wow, that's interesting. It's very interesting. So again, I mean, we always say that maybe if a first degree relative has obstructive sleep apnea, it's likely that you may have it as well. Um, so that's an interesting connection as well for people that do suffer with restless leg syndrome to be aware of um, their, you know, relatives that may suffer from the same syndrome, you know, and, and have them guided towards help, you know. So good. I think we've covered everything, Mo. Any last leaving comments for people out there that may be suffering and maybe having a difficult time with medication or therapy or sleep apnea therapy? What, what would your advice be to those people? I would say talk to other people in the your group chats and see what's working for somebody else um, that you haven't thought about. And... Uh, lifestyle changes that uh, are things that are that you try and uh, keep trying. Uh, perseverance is the key and that you know it's a chronic condition that you have to live with and that everything that you, anything that you're doing to try and, and improve it and improve your sleep is all for the better. Yeah sure sure and it's a great point to make as well it is a chronic condition and it's unfortunately something that's not there's no known cure. You have to 
live with with treatment and also the adjunct treatments that you mentioned earlier like you know going to bed earlier less wine less stimulants so that's all great advice mo i really appreciate you coming on here and um sharing your experience thank you kevin it's been a pleasure speaking with you yeah and you're going to be a member of our awake group now after this <laughs> <laughs> So I did, before I leave I, um, this speaker series, I did want to bring in Teresa Schumard, who actually has an announcement for everyone. Hi, Kevin. Thank you so much for that introduction. We are, we are very happy to have had some RLS information to uh, share with our community. This is great. I, uh, I thought it was very interesting for uh, when Kevin and Mo were talking about their experiences, being that they worked in an office together and they were sharing information and uh, they, they were CPAP, they were both on CPAP and then they discovered another coworker became uh, a CPAP user. So they all three together would give advice to each other, support and, and what have you. Um, so that, that was, they were fortunate that they had that. And you know, the, uh, the American Sleep Apnea Association goes back more than 30 years now. And in more than, more than anything in the beginning, it was founded to help people help other people, just patients helping patients. And this is a really uh, important facet of sleep apnea is having that, well, or, or any illness, uh, but is having that peer group that you can rely on. So we are just delighted to offer to our community with, there's no charge for this service, but the ASAA is working on and is conducting at this time the Awake Peer Mentors Program. And it is for people with sleep apnea who feel like, you know, they have mastered it or they're doing well. They've, they're not a new CPAP user anymore. And uh, they will uh, help another person. And how they do that is they have a mentee. So they'll have the, the mentor will be the experienced and the mentee will be the, uh, the new CPAP user that may be having some difficulties. Uh, some people just take to it and everything is fine and other people experience difficulties and it's just a fact of life. But to have those people there that are of your peer group is very important. Um, it's, uh, and some people, some people are doing it. We're offering a $50, uh, gift to the first 2000 people or something like that. And all of our mentors are so, you know, so far they're, they don't even, they don't want the $50. They just want to pay back and give back to the community. So very refreshing. We have some great mentors and we'd like more of you out there if you are, um, you know, an experienced person, or if you know of someone to, who's experienced, please send them to sleepapnea.org, and you can see across the top of this the screen you will see awake peer mentors, and just click on that and find out about everything you have to do. Thank you, everybody, and we look forward to seeing you again on our next speaker series. Bye-bye. Thank you for joining us today. Be an awake angel and you can help those financially impacted by COVID-19. Just $50 can provide two CPAP masks to someone in need. Please visit sleephappyorg slash donate for details. SAA is a patient-focused organization. Please like and subscribe to our YouTube page, join us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or sleepapnea.org and you can join the conversation. It's all free.